I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about Russia's new space-based anti-satellite weapon, we have with us Carrie Bingen, who is the director of our Aerospace Security Project, and Heather Williams, who is the director of our Project on Nuclear Issues. Welcome, colleagues. Thank you for being here. Thanks for the invitation. Super to be here. So you both wrote an op-ed in the New York Times last month called, Is This a Sputnik Moment? And it discussed Russia's new space-based anti-satellite weapon. Heather, can you explain the specifics of this new capability and what it actually is? Sure. I don't know how many specifics we have that I can really get into, but I can get into what we do know. So in mid-February, there were these reports coming off the hill about a, quote, serious national security threat, which was pretty vague and open at first. But then we got a bit more details from some folks on the Hill and also from the administration. And um, it, we were told that this is, as you said, a Russian space-based anti-satellite capability that potentially violates the Outer Space Treaty. And so everyone jumps to thinking, oh, this means that the Russians are putting nuclear weapons in space. But there's still a bunch of questions that we have to figure out before I think we can definitely jump to that conclusion. Subsequent reporting suggested that Russia could be launching a nuclear weapon into space sometime this year. We know that that's what the U.S. told its allies. Also, that Russia seems to have done some test launches back in 2022, and this is all from New York Times reporting. But the actual specifics, we aren't getting those details yet from the administration or really from the intel community. So in terms of specifics, a lot of speculation. Nonetheless, a pretty concerning potential development if Russia is thinking about putting nuclear weapons in space. You all wrote in your op-ed If this is what the White House suggests, we may now find ourselves facing this generation's Sputnik moment. And you went on to say, just as Sputnik spurred leaders into action in the last century, this moment should do the same. Carrie, why is this new development important? This development is important largely because of how dependent we and really the globe has become on space Space fuels our economy. We use it in our everyday lives and we don't realize it from communications and TV broadcasts to weather to navigation in our iPhones and cars to agriculture. And then our national security rests on the premise that space is there for our intelligence gathering, for detecting missile launches, for our warfighters that use GPS, communications. Uh, It is foundational to really how we fight. Let me ask it this way. If Russia were to launch a nuclear weapon into space and that weapon was detonated in space, what kind of impact would it actually have and would it affect our daily lives? If Russia detonated a nuclear weapon in space, it could be catastrophic and it could wipe out orbits, constellations of satellites, whether they be communication satellites, intelligence gathering satellites, And these are space capabilities that we and and frankly, the globe, we rely on in our everyday lives, whether it be for communications, weather, navigation in our cars or or using our phones to the the national security community, to our warfighters relying on those same space assets, whether overseas or gathering intelligence and and protecting our nation. So this would be uh, tremendously impactful and, and a significant threat that is different than what we have seen to date. Okay, well, Heather, I want to ask you, what factors might prompt Russia to resort to use such a weapon? So I think there's two scenarios that we should be considering. One of them would be with regards to the war in Ukraine. As we know from the open source reporting that the test launches were seemingly done right around the time at the start of the invasion, But we also know, obviously, the Ukrainians have been highly dependent on Starlink for their own operations. And a lot of what Russia has been doing with regards to nuclear weapons and nuclear treaties seems to be tied to what's happening on the ground 
in Ukraine. Um, my colleagues and I in the Project on Nuclear Issues released a report earlier this year called Deter and Divide, where we map Russian statements and threats about nuclear weapons and show that they they really do track with events on the ground. So if Russia did want to go ahead with this capability and actually detonated a nuclear weapon, we should assume that it has something to do with the war in Ukraine. But another reason that Russia might be suggesting that they will do this is really for deterrence purposes. There's some speculation that if Russia did another launch and suggested that there was a nuclear weapon being put in space, it could be a dummy warhead. And so I think the important thing here is Russia wants us to think that they would do something like this. And again, that really does track with other Russian nuclear threats throughout the war in Ukraine and a lot of Putin's own rhetoric about these issues. So I think it's important to really differentiate what they could do, what they might do, and what they want us to think that they would do. And so there's just a whole lot of uncertainty and ambiguity around this, as I keep stressing, but that's really part of Russia's MO when it comes to nuclear threats these days. It's about sowing uncertainty and really trying to up the ante. And Russia sees how dependent the United States is on space. They have a lot less to to lose these days. Their space program is deteriorating. As they see the United States put up more communication satellites like Starlink and how critical that they've been on the battlefield and providing a lifeline to troops there, uh, they see the Department of Defense building these constellations of dozens to hundreds of satellites. They see the intelligence community building hundreds of satellites. I imagine they are sitting back in, back in Moscow and thinking through, how do we hold those space assets at risk? And some of the other space threat weapons that they built in the past, uh, jammers or lasers or even missiles that would target satellites, those are largely, I'll say, one versus one weapons. A nuclear weapon in space would be considered a 1v many. It's a way to take out many satellites as opposed to just a few. Carrie, I, I wanted to ask you to elaborate a bit on this ongoing competition um, and activity in space between the U.S. and Russia. You say Russia's program is deteriorating, but they are still quite active, apparently. They are, but this is not the Soviet space program of decades ago. Sanctions are biting them. Uh, they've seen a brain drain. Uh, money is leaving Russian space programs. The Europeans have gotten out. Others have gotten out. So, yes, they can still launch as cosmonauts to the space station. But in terms of building satellites and putting them on orbit, their capacity has degraded quite a bit. So is this really just a strong arm play to scare us or make us react, make us spend more money, frustrate the United States, all of the above? It's a great question. I don't think we know the answer to that, but it is a space weapon in their arsenal that could hold at risk a lot of capability, but it would be incredibly indiscriminate and it would cross a nuclear threshold. I mean, I know it's in space. Uh, General Hyten, who's the former vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, used to say satellites don't have mothers. So maybe it's a way to cross that nuclear threshold or to cross that nuclear taboo, perhaps in a, a less, I'll say a less visible way, but still nevertheless crosses that threshold. Heather, you mentioned before the Outer Space Treaty. This is a treaty from uh, 1967. Can you give us a breakdown of what that is and why it's important? Sure. It prohibits the placement of any weapons of mass destruction in space. And it came after a round of nuclear testing in the 60s, including by the United States, that was um, doing uh, nuclear tests at really high altitudes, some of which had some pretty devastating and catastrophic effects. And so that was one of the many things that kind of prompted this initiative, this, this Outer Space Treaty. I think it's important to point out, though, this is one of the only arms control treaties, nuclear arms control treaties left standing, um, in which we had thought was somewhat healthy and in good stead. 
So just like, you know, Carrie said that this isn't your Soviet era space program, this also isn't your Soviet era arms control. Russia is just walking away from all of its arms control obligations. It's consistently been cheating on arms control agreements like the 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, suspended participation in New START, de-ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And so if this is actually a violation of the Outer Space Treaty, it's kind of, it's part of a pattern of Russian behavior recently on just walking away from various arms control commitments. One thing that I think is an, an interesting twist that makes this one a little bit different, though, is that historically, Russia has tried to be the champion of arms control in outer space. For quite a while now, they've been pushing this uh, agreement on the prevention of an arms race in outer space, the Paris Treaty. And they introduced some language on this in 2008. And that was meant to prevent the placement of basically any weapons at all in outer space or on celestial bodies. And in a lot of diplomatic forums, Russia often pulls out this draft of the Treaty of the Paros Treaty and says, you know, we're the ones who are really trying to champion arms control in outer space here. Uh, that treaty was really about missile defense. It wasn't just about, um, you know, WMD in outer space. But if this is actually a violation of the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, it just is, you know, kind of another nail in the coffin of arms control as we know it. Okay, so... How does the world hold Russia accountable for such a violation? I think there's a couple things that should happen. Uh, first and foremost would be targeting uh, India and China, which I think Secretary of State Blinken did during the Munich Security Conference when he pulled his Russia or his um, Chinese and Indian counterparts aside and said, let's be clear, if a nuclear weapon is used in space, your satellites are going to be taken out too. You know, this um, this type of detonation would be really indiscriminate as far as we understand. And so trying to get some of Russia's I wouldn't say allies, but colleagues on board with pressuring Russia not to go ahead with launching a nuclear weapon in space and certainly to never use a nuclear weapon in space. That's the first step, I think. Um, I also do think that the administration can, you know, kind of double down on international pressure on Russia not to go ahead with this. It's really hard to tell whether or not Vladimir Putin cares about international opinion. He quite clearly cares about domestic opinion. That's really important to him. And we can see that in how he leverages his domestic media. But uh, it's not obvious if that international opinion would really matter. But nonetheless, you know, the U.S. is doing the Biden administration, at least, is doing everything it can to try to save what is left of arms control. And this has to be part of that effort. Carrie, uh, you know, I want to go to you on this. So what steps can the United States and our allies take to mitigate the risks that are posed by Russia's capability here? Yeah, it's it's a great question, Andrew. And, and I would build on what Heather just said is when the White House spokesman came out and discussed this threat, he was very clear to say that they do not believe it is yet active. So first and foremost, let's work as an international community to ensure that it does not become active. And so that is through measures that Heather suggested in terms of bringing greater international pressure to bear and really more transparency about, uh, let's be clear about what Russia is developing here. From a space perspective, it means continuing to think differently about the architectures that we build in space. And what I mean by that is we have long been building these really large, exquisite satellites that are the size of buses and cost billions of dollars, you're seeing this shift happen where the decreasing cost of launch and just the proliferation of satellite technology and smaller components, we can now build smaller satellites and a lot more of them. So if you can, if you can put up these proliferated constellations in different orbits, you can take a hit and keep the mission going. So building resiliency into your architectures, that's going to be really important. But then also is investing in various protection and defense measures. So I would note just recently, uh, U.S. Space Command uh, put out their, they, the, the annual budget came out, they put out their unfunded 
requirements list. And they said, hey, we still need some more capability in the space defense arena and in our ability to see what's happening in space. We call that space situational awareness. So there's still more work to be done in terms of actually investing, not just in the architectures, but also um, our protect and our defend capabilities. And then lastly, there's more work to be done in integrating allied space capabilities, commercial space capabilities. So you have a much broader array of capabilities to support our users on the ground. But also if you're China or Russia and you're looking at targeting satellites, hey, it's you're not just targeting the US anymore. You're targeting our allies. You're affecting our, our commercial companies. Do you really want to take that on? Heather, what areas do you think the United States should prioritize investing in um, given this set of circumstances? There's a couple of areas where the U.S. should really be prioritizing investments. I think Carrie just hit on the most important of all, which is resilience in space. And her Carrie and her team have done great work, I think, in outlining some recommendations for that. But in addition to that, I, I think that this potential development, again, there's a lot we don't know, but this potential development is part of a wider trend of Russia increasing reliance on nuclear weapons for a variety of strategic objectives. It's really trying to bully the US and NATO and other countries to stay out of its neighborhood. It's claiming certain rights over sovereign countries that it really doesn't have, and nuclear weapons are backing that. Uh, And so that increased reliance on nuclear weapons has a lot of implications for U.S. nuclear strategy uh, and U.S. nuclear investments, I think. You know, the U.S. is currently going through a really expensive nuclear modernization program. So that would also be at the top of my list of priorities for U.S. decision makers is see through the current modernization plan. Russia has claimed that they are just over 80 percent through with their nuclear modernization and that, you know, they just modernize differently than we do. They modernize more, have to modernize more frequently. But in that sense, we are not up to speed in our own modernization plans. And anyone who reads the news about Sentinel and the ICBM program can see where there have been some challenges. And so this latest news, along with a lot of other Russian developments on nuclear issues, really should just reinforce the importance of the current modernization plan. There are some other ideas floating around out there about other possible prioritizations for um, defense spending. You know, some folks are talking about more regional nuclear capabilities. The uh, acronym, the fun acronym for this one, SLICMN, is floating around a lot. So, sea launch cruise missile nuclear option. Um, and, you know, a lot of that is more about what Russia and potentially China would be trying to do in their regions. But all to say that this increase in reliance on nuclear weapons, the breakdown of arms control agreements, it really forces the United States to have to make some really hard decisions about where its strategic investments go. But for now, I I would say the top two are that space resilience that Carrie talked about and the current modernization plan. Up until now, there's a very specific and narrow policy community that's been following these issues. You two are part of it. But it seems to me now that this issue is out in the open. Um, Many policymakers are going to need to be brought up to speed on this. How, How is that going? And do you think right now policymakers on the Hill are, uh, have an appetite to be aware of this? I can jump in on this one first. I think it's important to differentiate between the folks who work on nuclear issues in, in government, in the administration, in the military all the time. They are incredibly well-versed on these issues. And, you know, the Biden administration in particular has a pretty deep bench and good knowledge on a lot of nuclear issues. And so on that side, I I feel pretty good, pretty confident. On Capitol Hill, I think it's a slightly different story. You have a couple folks on the Hill who are very conversant, very knowledgeable about these issues. Um, And I I think we saw statements from some of those folks just in light of this news. But overall, I have um, been pretty consistently surprised by the lack of engagement on Capitol Hill with specific nuclear issues. Now, on the one hand, you know, people, you know, you can push back on that because investment in nuclear modernization is one of the few areas of bipartisan support at the moment. Like, you know, the funding requests for nuclear modernization are consistently approved with bipartisan support. However, I worry a little bit that that is out of ignorance and a lack of engagement on nuclear issues more so than it is on an actual deep understanding 
of what our strategic requirements are. The one other set of stakeholders that I think it's worth pointing to is actually the public. You know, like it, it's not a joke. Oppenheimer really woke up the American public to nuclear issues and the fact that we still live in a nuclear world with thousands of nuclear warheads. And I think on the one hand, it's great that Oppenheimer did kind of, you know, stir up that public interest. Sustaining it's going to be a challenge. And I think that this is interrelated with that lack of congressional knowledge. You know, members of Congress, they have really full dockets. They have a lot going on. They're probably not going to engage with issues too much unless their constituents start um, bringing it to them. And so just raising public awareness of nuclear issues, I think, needs to be an ongoing effort. Uh, clearly, the power of Hollywood when it operates at that level is significant. Yeah, it definitely had an impact. I mean, just the number of stories I've seen coming out of you know newspapers and think tanks about uh, nuclear issues, but also like I'm watching this Netflix series. I think it's called Turning Point about the Cold War and the atomic bomb. And it's like if you yeah, the director of Turning Point was on this podcast two weeks ago. Brilliant. So. I mean, if you had told me two years ago that one of Netflix's like most watched documentaries would be about the Cold War and nuclear weapons, you know, I, I wouldn't have believed you. And that's, for my opinion, that's directly tied to Oppenheimer. And I'm really grateful for the series. I think it's doing a pretty good job of trying to uh, promote that public engagement. Our listeners can scroll back a couple podcasts and listen to it uh, right from the director's mouth. He worked on that series of pieces for years. Carrie, I want to give you the last word. What what do you think U.S. policymakers should prioritize and how should we prioritize educating them? Well, I, I guess I should not segue off of your and Heather's discussion to talk about the other Netflix series, Space Force. Oh. But, I mean, there, <laughs> we haven't had them this, on Truth of the Matter yet. <laughs> it is threats like this that are the reason that the U.S. Space Force was established in 2019. I do want to avoid being alarmist here. I mean, I I believe that if Russia does pursue nuclear weapons in space, there will likely be a high threshold for use. But it is that ultimate, as Heather just said, deterrent or coercive weapon of, hey, U.S., don't mess with us. We can make your day and others miserable. But there are a range of threats that our space community, the policymakers, the operators are dealing with every day. You're seeing it in Ukraine from cyber attacks on satellite networks to jamming of GPS and of Starlink. So there's a whole range of threats that our space community has to deal with. And that is really why Space Force was created, because space has become so vital in our everyday lives, to our economy, to our financial vitality, to science, to national security, that we now need a military service to defend our interests there. There will be a range of priority actions that will have to be taken, and it is everything that we've talked about here, which is in the diplomatic and international space, highlighting these threats, building pressure, on Russia, providing transparency in, in what they're doing to specific capability investments in nuclear modernization, in architecture resiliency, and actual protection capabilities. And then there's an operational piece to this as well, which is just ensuring whether it's our nuclear operators or our space operators, they know that space is no longer this pristine environment, is we need to develop the tactics, the techniques, do training and exercising now, assuming that space is this contested domain. And so you're seeing all of those different pieces, I think, all happen in parallel or need to happen in parallel. Well, Carrie, Heather, you've given us a lot to think about here. Thanks so much for your insight and for your expertise on these matters that very few of us understand. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 